And that, that's just, that was a great follow-up uh, for those of you who sat through Brian's introduction to that 100RC last night. Now to hear it from the guy in the trench uh, on the ground and his perspective and experience thus far with the program is really valuable. So we're going to move right on now to our, um, our third speaker again. If you've got the questions, write them down. You can hand them to Joel in the back of the room or um, we can line up the mic. Jim Reddick comes from the city of Norfolk, Virginia. He's an emergency manager and uh, really happy to have, have you here, uh, Jim. So thanks for coming. Uh, he's one of those practitioners, uh, again, in the trench, if you will, like we just, like, uh, like to say with NHMA. And he's also sort of embraced what we're trying to do through the association with not only you know, applying and doing great things at the local level, but as you'll hear, uh, he's also been tapped by, by the governor in Virginia to help all of the lessons learned and, and permeate that good work he's doing in Norfolk uh, throughout the Commonwealth. So Jim is the Director of Emergency Preparedness and Response for the City of Norfolk, Virginia, one of the, uh, another one of the original cities uh, selected to participate in Rockefeller's 100RC Challenge. He is a Certified Emergency Manager with the International Association of Emergency Managers, IAENM, and he was the 2012 Virginia Emergency Management Professional of the Year. Among the numerous committees on which he serves, Jim built up and chairs Team Norfolk Emergency Operations, which is a group of community partners spanning public, private, nonprofit, higher education, and military, whose focus is on the unity of effort for mitigation, prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. He was appointed to a second term on the Virginia Governor's Secure Commonwealth Panel, panel where he co-chaired with Virginia Senator John Watkins, a sub-panel focused on the high probability and high impact threat of recurrent flooding and sea level rise. And again, I don't know how you find the time, Jim, but he also serves as an adjunct uh, instructor for his alma mater, Old Dominion University, ODU, teaching emergency management and policy. Uh, so Jim comes to us from ground zero uh, in some of the places along with Miami Beach, facing sea level rise and some serious coastal flooding uh, issues, and we look forward to hearing from you, Jim. Uh, again, I'm from uh, Norfolk, Virginia, Hampton Roads area, uh, certainly the uh, naval station, uh, the capital of the world. We are home to the largest naval station. Uh, we have a lot of partners. We're blessed to have a lot of partners. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you ways that uh, we, we have found that we can actually work together and, and eliminate duplications of efforts uh, and really establish that unity of effort. So as you can see, we are a waterfront locality uh, and have been, and, and we've been blessed with that. That's been a I mean, that's why we're there. I mean, we, we rely on the water not just for recreation, but our economy. But as we talk about resilience, it's also important to, to look at where we've been and how we've gotten to where we are now. So when you look at the original colony uh, in Alpha, that is the original piece right there. And you can see all the wetlands around the marsh areas uh, all throughout. And that was back in 1682. If you look at it more recently, that's that original footprint, and that's just our downtown area. And that's why we have issues like this. So all those marshland areas that have since been developed, and for a variety of reasons, I mean, economic development is certainly one, but if you think about it, I mean, back in 1855, one of the threats that we faced and experienced was the yellow fever, where we had thousands of, of people die. Um, so what causes a lot of those public health emergencies? mosquitoes, and where do they live? So there are not just economic development, but there are other reasons, and without necessarily having that long-term vision of what impacts could be uh, had by developing in certain areas, this is, is essentially the result. And as we talk about sea level rise and recurrent flooding in Norfolk, where our citizens want to know what we're doing about it now, it's important to, to communicate realistic expectations that it took us a while to get here, and it's certainly going to take us a little while to get out of it, but at least we can move in the right direction together. Again, multiple sectors and levels of government all moving in the right direction, doing the right thing. Anyone else experience that, by the way? <laughs> so, um, so, again, my job as an emergency manager is probably similar to a lot of yours. My elevator uh, description of our job is we're paid to tell people things they don't want to hear, to spend money they don't have on things they don't think will ever happen. Is that, is that consistent? Okay. So we do that. And one of the things that we've been successful at since, since I've gotten to Norfolk in 2011 is building Team Norfolk Emergency Operations. So every locality uh, is required to have an LEPC, a Local Emergency Planning Committee. And I'll try to explain every acronym. If I miss one, throw something at me because the world I live in in public safety emergency management is certainly like you. 
Uh, there's acronyms all over the place, so I'll do my best to explain those. So, a local emergency planning committee, the genesis of that is to marry up and, and otherwise develop relationships between first responders, those facility owners and operators who house chemicals, so they know when there is an actual fire, you know, what they're going to be going into. And through the Community Right to Know Act, uh, you know, that, telling the community that the folks in those neighborhoods what those hazards are, what evacuation routes uh, are there, and, and everything else like that. So we've taken that concept and really put it on steroids. So we don't just focus on chemicals, we focus on all hazards, man-made, natural, technical, um, and so that way everyone has an awareness of what our hazards are. So we've talked about the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000, the requirement to have a natural mitigation plan, and we try to build on that too to include the technical and man-made hazards, and sharing that information. So again, to the detriment of, of maybe some consultants in the room, there are a lot of private sector partners that we bring to the table. And, and like Greg said, if you don't give them something of value, they're never gonna come back. And so one of the things that we give them is, again, we're required to have that mitigation plan, which has that hazard identification risk assessment. So one thing you'll probably hear me say a few times is silos of excellence. They're, I mean, everyone does a great job meeting those requirements, but they don't need to. You're, they're spending money on something that already exists where we brought in through federal funds, excuse me, federal funds and otherwise, to put together that hazard identification risk assessment, which we would share with you, and that way we have a unified understanding, that situational awareness of what those threats are in our community. And again, we don't just focus on the natural hazards, we also focus on all the national planning scenarios, which is, is significant in the, uh, the terrorism focus, the public health focus, catastrophic storms and the like. Um, so we bring all that together and share that with our partners. And I'll show you our outline later on, but you know, we, we develop who the team is, what our hazards are, how we're gonna respond, and we do that all together as a team. So while we meet monthly as an LAPC, and we meet as needed as emergency support functions, and emergency support functions are, are just that, they're function-based, and it comes out of the National uh, Recovery, I'm sorry, National Response Plan, strike that, National Response Framework now, uh, at the federal level, which explains the federal government's roles, responsibilities, lead agencies, support agencies, uh, which the state has developed and we developed. So ESF-1 is transportation, 2 is communication, 3 is public works and engineering, all the way down the line. So we meet collectively, we meet as specific function of representatives, regardless of sector of government or, or level, of, uh, level of government or sector, we're bringing those relationships together. I'm gonna throw a couple quotes at you. Um, so as I talk about the building of relationships, I'll quote Mike Tyson. He said, everyone has a plan to get punched in the face. So by doing that, by meeting as an LEPC and emergency support functions, you're building those relationships because you certainly can't plan for everything. But in, again, in a world of disaster preparedness and, and crisis planning, there's gonna be curveballs. But as long as you know who's on the other side of the phone, what their capabilities are, uh, and you've established those relationships, you'll be able to get through anything. You'll be more resilient and not necessarily fall into those gaps that we often see in our plan. So, a number of reasons why we do this with our LAPC. Again, build relationships, satisfy all kinds of requirements. Again, back to silos of excellence. We have partners on the private sector side, certainly the hospitals, higher education, uh, the military, and so many more who have requirements to meet on a regular basis. Likewise, they have requirements to have plans. They have requirements to do exercises, either annual, biannual, or whatever that is. And they're all doing that, but why can't we bring that together? If we're all required to do those exercises, why wouldn't we develop scenarios that knock out those capabilities and have fewer or more robust exercises, uh, leveraging whatever funds and resources exist, and, and knock those out of the park, actually forcing us to communicate with each other. Because if you've participated in an exercise, communications and interoperability is always number one in the after action reports. So by forcing us to do that, and actually talking realistic expectations, not just assumptions, uh, realistic expectations of who can really do what, or if we know this resource is gonna be available, but it's not gonna be really available until you know, they get called up, they get deployed, they're gonna come over here, which is gonna be at least 36 to 72 hours. I mean, having all those realistic expectations, that situational awareness to make our plans actually useful and not just something that's gonna sit on the shelf and again, just check some boxes. Uh, talk about communication strategies, memorandums of understandings, contracts, agreements. Uh, again, train together and exercise together and then confirm and con uh, that contact information. 
Again, in terms of a disaster, we certainly have everyone's office numbers. We have a lot of times their cell phone numbers, but we also have their home numbers, their 24 hour contact information, their satellite phone numbers. And again, through exercising, we realized, okay, there's a lot of us that have satellite phones. Okay, you don't, okay, but you do. Okay, so assume we need to rely on satellite communications because in a catastrophic storm, we're not gonna be able to communicate. We don't know each other's numbers. We don't even know our own numbers. I mean, how many people know their satellite phone numbers? So having to get that out. And so as long as I know yours, and then we know uh, ours and we know yours, what trigger do we have in our plan to actually take them out of a Pelican case and turn them on and go outside? I mean, if, if anyone's ever used a satellite phone, it's, it's not just picking up your cell phone and using it. There are things that you have to do, and you have to have those triggers in your plans, otherwise they're going to be useless. It's just going to be bricks sitting in your office. So again, I'll just kind of breeze through these slides to show you some of the partners with whom we work. It's not uh, exhaustive, but um, it's, it really should show you that in Norfolk and your community, you have an all-star cast of, of folks with so many resources. And bringing those together, you'll be able to get through anything with that understanding that we're all in it together. We can't wait for the cavalry to come. We have to be pretty resilient by identifying who our partners are, what resources, technical expertise, uh, talent that we have, and then rely on those uh, to build up that robust system. So how do we work together? In the public safety world, we use something called the Incident Command System, and Greg kind of alluded to it. So we have our daily roles, but when there's an actual incident, you're moved into another function that, that is really focused, not so much on seniority, but on capability and knowledge of the incident. So uh, there is someone in charge, an incident commander, and then there's different sections. And I think I might have a, okay, I don't have a copy of it. Um, there's different sections. There's the operations section, which is focused on the now. They're doing the search and rescue. They're doing the firefighting. They're doing the law enforcement. They're doing the human services piece, search and rescue, all that stuff. While the planning section is looking at that next operational period. So an operational period being eight hours, 12 hours, whatever it is, that's what makes the incident command system more proactive. So while the ops folks are doing the now, these guys are planning for the next one. The logistics section is responsible for getting us our stuff, identifying who has what, uh, how we're going to make that happen, whether it's local, regional, state, or federal. 
and then the finance folks are actually tracking all the costs because as it pertains to reimbursement, uh, according to FEMA, if it's not documented, it never happened. So we have to have that documentation trail of everything that occurred, the hours of work, what was procured, all that stuff, and that's what the finance section is, is responsible for. So that's how we do that. And while we can't have everybody in our emergency operations center, we use Adobe Connect within the Homeland Security Information Network. So when we do our EOC briefings, we're bringing our team Norfolk partners to the table through conference call and through that video conferencing so they can see the slides that I'm doing in the EOC. They're part of those conversations. We're talking about the goals and objectives for that operational period, making sure everyone's in sync. We're bringing all those resources together towards unified goals and objectives, and then we go through each emergency support function. What are your issues or concerns? Questions. What do you want to get out to the what do you want to get out to the community? So we can feed our PIOs information. They're not trying to track anything down. We're feeding them information of all kinds of things that, I mean, you heard the term feed the beast, right, as it pertains to the media. We're giving them things continuously based on those conference calls. And again, everyone walks away with that situational awareness, that incident action plan of what we're doing. So it's a comprehensive, community-wide response effort, not, I wonder what Norfolk uh, Nor Nor EOC is doing, and I wonder what Centera Norfolk Nor General is doing, and I wonder what Old Dominion is doing. We're all in it together. So we have a core group of folks, regardless of the incident, and then we add more folks to the table based on whatever that scenario is. So this Team Norfolk Emergency Operations and Resilience Framework, again, what Greg was saying, this is how we bring it all together. And when we, were, uh, when we became part of the uh, 100RC, I was adamant, we do not need another document. Do not create a resilience framework because we have this, and this is exactly where it fits in. So volume one is the mitigation and prevention plan. Uh, like they were saying earlier, if it's not in a mitigation plan, it's not eligible for mitigation funds. So we have to be sure that everything that we want to do in our Vision 2100, our capital improvement plans, or whatever it is, have that in the goals, uh, the goals and objectives of the mitigation and prevention plan. So we identify what it is that we're planning for. The basic administrative plan is these are the capabilities that we're going to use. This is the command and control. This is what we're going to do for any incident, regardless if it's a hurricane, winter storm, a terrorist attack, or whatever. These are the capabilities that we're going to implement, and these are the folks with whom we're going to work. And then volume three is the Team Norfolk Charter. These are our community partners. Again, not just local government, because it would never work if it's just local government. It's public safety, um, it's public, private, not-for-profit, higher education, military. This is how we work together. This is how often we meet. These are the subcommittees that we have. This is our exercise and training schedule, and everything you know, participates in that. And again, this plan is Norfolk Public Schools' plan, is Norfolk State University's plan, is everybody else's plan by which they go back to their respective organization and develop their SFPs with that realistic information. The ESF annexes I told you about, the functional supporting annexes, hazard-specific annexes. Again, every the actor shooter annex, for example, and, and it's sad because we, we that, that tends to be what drives us on the next plan that we're developing is, is actual events. So everyone wanted to know what would happen if we had an active uh, active threat, active shooter. So we brought Team Norfolk together. Pop, pop. This is your facility. What do you do? And we had rec centers there, library, schools, everyone else. <clears throat> Okay, you're going to evacuate, or no, you're going to call for help, you're going to call 911, but you're also going to do a lockdown. How do you do a lockdown? Do you do it over the intercom? Do you use a special code word? Or do you use plain language? Is that effective? Okay, you're going to call 911. 911 dispatcher, what kind of questions are you going to ask uh, to get the most effective response? And, and how do you communicate that help is on the way even as you're asking these questions, but as you're getting responses, you'll be able, able, excuse me, better able to inform those responders that are coming on scene. Our police, you're going to arrive on scene. Are you going to help the victims, or are you going to step over them to neutralize the threat? Okay, fire and EMS, you're going to come in behind them to help them uh, help the victims. And medical examiner's office, I mean, you, you take care of the, you know, the bodies. And hospitals, I mean, we can't send realistic expectations, you know, how much space is in an emergency room. So you're going to send these students to different places uh, and different hospitals, sometimes even out of the region. So again, having that discussion of Really, what's going to happen, and then they can come away with that hazard-specific annex that they go back and, and you know make sure that their plans are in sync with ours. And then the long-term recovery plan is definitely what I work with Christine Morris, our resilience officer in Alpha, because our biggest fear is, what if? What if Sandy hit us instead of New York, New Jersey? And it could have. So do we have in place the plans, the policies, the vision to not only rebuild, but not focus on rebuilding so quickly, but rebuilding more smartly, stronger. In areas, do we rebuild in certain areas, uh, or do we not? I mean, and do we have the community buy-in 
to make those types of decisions. And that's something, again, we're working on now, making sure that we're, we're, we're inclusive in that whole planning process and bringing that all together, along with the capabilities and depth assessment. So that's a, a gross representative of the incident command system, but you can kind of see regardless, and it's a scalable system, regardless of the number of partners that you bring to the table, they fit into the structure and it allows for that communication and accountability up and down. Um, and, um, and so that's, that's, it's used uh, by us and it's, it's uh, actually pretty uh, beneficial to us. So at the state level, uh, just to run in there real quick and, and cut me off if I'm kind of fine. Uh, serving on the Governor's Secure Commonwealth Panel, our mission is to make recommendations to the executive branch uh, on uh, issues pertaining to Homeland Security and emergency management. So William & Mary's uh, Virginia in uh, Incident of Marine Science was chartered by the General Assembly to put together a, a report called Recurrent Flooding in the Tidewater Region. Couldn't say sea level rise. It had to be recurrent flooding. We're past that now. So they presented this report and you know, we read through it and essentially as a coastal community, I had the opportunity to say, look, we're presented with this report that outlines a significant high probability, high impact threat to us. Not just you know, the folks, you know, higher education researchers and folks you know, who have been beating this drum forever, not necessarily you know, talking about just the environmental impacts or anything else like that, uh, which are significant. But in order, we learned to get traction, we said this is a significant threat to our critical infrastructure, to our economy, and our national security. When you think about Hampton Boulevard, a major artery in Norfolk that leads to Naval Station Norfolk, if they can't get to the base, then they can't achieve their mission. When you think of, I know UASI was mentioned earlier, the Urban Area Security Initiative, that, those are grants, Homeland Security dollars coming into the region to buy equipment for response for catastrophic incidents or otherwise. If they can't get to the scene because the roads are flooded, well then how valuable is that asset? Is it usable at all? So to take a, a bigger step back and say, what do we really need to address here? Well, it's recurrent flooding and sea level rise. The only difference is, and again, we use public safety parlance, the incident command system other because we said this is a threat. It's a threat just like a hurricane, just like a terrorist attack, and just like a winter storm. The only difference is the timing. So we may get five days, may or may not. May, we may get five days to see a hurricane coming off the coast of Africa, across the Atlantic, and heading in our way. So we have time to react. We see it coming and we can react. That's not so with sea level rise. It's incremental. It's very, it's very uh, slow. Uh, the good thing is it's slow because we have time to react, but the bad thing is it's slow because some folks don't even think it's happening. And again, when we're asked that, I simply say, in Norfolk, you know, we have the tide gauges, we have the science, we have the researchers, but just open your door. I mean, during a regular, uh, during a regular uh, lunar high tide, we get flooding like we never did. And so it, that's it compounded when we actually have storms. Uh, and certainly nor'easters, where you have that stacking tide effect. So uh, for us, that's the approach that, that we are taking at the state level. That's what we promoted and recommended, and that's the direction that we're moving. The first thing that we did, and that's the report that we put together in the middle, is we took the VIM study that's on the upper left, we took um, the 2008 uh, Governor, uh, at, at you know, that time, Governor Kane's Climate Change Committee report. Uh, again, because if you think about the hours put into these reports and the great expertise, talents, and resources put into those reports, why would we not build on that instead of just writing yet another plan? So there's a uh, critical infrastructure plan, there's a JLAC report, which is a Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission, you know, talking about preparedness in Virginia. Um, and then there's the Sandy study from the U. Uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, their North Atlantic Coastal Comprehensive Study, that ever since Sandy came out, from Maine all the way down to Virginia, these are things that they recommend doing. And if we don't include them in our plans, then you know, good luck trying to get federal projects, federal funding done. We have to work with them. And then, oh yeah, Virginia actually had a floodplain management plan for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And, but no one knew about it, and it wasn't updated since 2002 or 2003. So we took all of those and put our recommendations together. And we also cited what, you know, it was in also in these reports. So getting back to Marietta's uh, comment, our, our motto here was a little less action, a little more, excuse me, a little less conversation, a little more action. This is our recommendation. How many times is this going to be recommended before we actually do something about it? So we say this was our, our recommendation, and it was also the recommendation of this report, this report, this, this report. And one of the recommendations was, going back to the incident command system, is having an incident commander who's in charge. And when we asked that question, who's in charge in Virginia at the state level, the answer was, it depends. Are we looking at Virginia code? Are we looking at executive order? Are we looking at different agreements that exist? 
Because when you looked at those different documents, there were different folks, different organizations in charge. So we, we, we promoted an incident command system, excuse me, incident command system, incident commander, and since nobody knew what the hell that was, we said, okay, it's a resilience coordinator. Oh, okay, I understand that. So we have a resilience coordinator now at the state level who is Secretary of Public Safety, Homeland Security, uh, Secretary Brian Moran. At the executive level, who's able to reach across different barriers against, against uh, different organizations and really get that buy-in. And so, full-time focus, he has a deputy secretary, and now they're hiring someone, an actual project coordinator, to do that work. And then establishing that four-year action plan cycle. So when I talk about that planning cell, looking at that next operational period, that's it. I mean, bringing all those resources together, having a unified approach, hopefully at the watershed or regional level, of what do we actually want to accomplish. Let's set out some meaningful, achievable objectives and see if we can't get there to determine if we're actually successful or not. Because, again, right now we don't have that. We don't have that measure to determine how effective we are. So unless we set some sort of action plan cycle like that, we're not going to know, the community's not going to know, and we're, we're, again, we're just existing in, in a world of who the heck knows what's going on. Um, I think this is my next to last slide. We talk about training and awareness. So just like what exists within this, this group right here, it brings together dis different disciplines because we have to share and achieve an actual unified awareness of what the problem is. You know, so sea level rise, to what level are we gonna plan? You know, is it gonna be two and a half feet, three feet, what is it? We have to have that understanding and then train everybody, certainly insurance companies, bankers, lenders, public works associations, bringing all those folks together to have those conversations and hopefully get the continuing education credits and the professional development so everyone, again, has those relationships, has that general understanding of how we're going to do it. And then, again, the critical infrastructure piece is key. Um, as I said before, VIMS, ODU, uh, William & Mary, so many folks have been banging the drum for years. But once we started saying economic uh, development, or lack thereof, uh, we some, once we talked about impacts to critical infrastructure and homeland security, that's really what got the traction, and, and that's something that we need to continue focusing on. So that incident command system I talked about a little before, this is kind of this will this will blow your mind in terms of how many organizations are um, involved. But that's how many organizations are involved. I mean, it's not just a three or four organization uh, incident they're responding to. So. How do we corral all those and establish that unity of effort? And so using the incident command system, uh, having the resilience coordinator being that incident commander and leveraging all the expertise throughout, relying on our higher education institutions and federal government to do that planning section, to tell us, well, is, is, are we looking at more sea level rise or are we looking at less? What's the latest projection? They're always working on that. And the operations section focusing on, well, these are the projects that we identified in our action plan. We want to knock these four things out, leveraging all the resources that exist, all the funding, grants, philanthropy, or otherwise, putting them all in one direction to be effective. And then logistics, working about on getting us our stuff, and also keeping an online tool, online presence, so anyone, any audience, business, pretend for a potential business, a homeowner, whoever it is, a planner at the city level or whatever, can go to that site and get the information that we're all using, collecting and consuming nuggets of information from all different sources that we see as the most reliable, putting that in one place. And then the finance section, again, keeping track of all the grants and everything that we've done. And that's, that's it. That was a lot. I hope I didn't talk too fast. All right. Thank you, everybody.